Okay, now let's talk about the basal nuclei. So first of all, uh, a little bit of nomenclature. Uh, the, the word basal nuclei uh, doesn't actually appear in your textbook. They refer to, <clears throat> refer to it as the basal ganglia. Um, and hopefully you know why that's not a good way to describe this system. So a ganglion is a term to describe a group of neurons in the peripheral nervous system, but this is a system that exists uh, in the brain, and so really it should be called the, uh, the basal nuclei. Um, but for historical reasons, it was called the basal ganglia for a long time. Uh, in fact, when I learned it, I uh, called it the basal ganglia. So more than likely, I may slip and call it the basal ganglia from time to time, but really uh, it should be called the basal nuclei, even though um, you know, you'll still see textbooks that refer to it as the basal ganglia from time to time. So the basal nuclei are a group of uh, different brain structures deep in the brain, mostly in the forebrain, that uh, get input from the, uh, the cerebral cortex, um, uh, including especially the prefrontal and parietal lobes, um, but really pretty much every uh, cortical region has a projection into the basal nuclei um, and then the basal nuclei uh, and we'll talk about what's inside the basal nuclei in a second uh, and then the basal nuclei uh, project to the thalamus to uh, a region called the ventral lateral nucleus uh, and then that structure projects back to the uh, the motor cortex specifically area six so this forms what's called the basal nuclei motor loop um, because it basically consists of a connection from the cortex to the basal nuclei and then the thalamus and then back to the cortex again. Um, but the, as we'll see in a second, the job of the basal nuclei are to help uh, regulate or control uh, the uh, input to the motor cortex that is then used to send commands to the motor neurons to control movement. So um, it's it's there to sort of uh, control which commands uh, are actually uh, executed upon and which ones aren't. Um, and so this is physically where the basal nuclei are located there. Uh, again, in the, uh, the basal forebrain um, for the most part. <clears throat> um, so that's part of the, the telencephalon. So if you remember back when we said that the, the brain develops from the neural tube and the, the forebrain, uh, which is the very anterior end of the neural tube, develops into the telencephalon and the diencephalon. Uh, most of the telencephalon turns into cerebral cortex, but uh, the part that doesn't we call the basal telencephalon and the basal telencephalon eventually develops partly into the uh, these this set of structures that we call the basal nuclei. So this is a cross-section, coronal sock cross-section through the, the forebrain and the diencephalon. <clears throat> and you can see most of the parts of the basal uh, nuclei here. So uh, the, the larger structures that you can see are, oops, are the, uh, uh, these two things here, the, the caudate nucleus and the putamen. Um, now in cross-section, those two things look like separate structures. They look like they're, they're two separate nuclei. Um, but in fact, they are one and the same. So this is what the caudate uh, nucleus and the putamen look like in 3D. And you can see that they're connected to each other. Basically, the, the caudate kind of loops around over the dorsal side of the putamen and then uh, goes into <clears throat> the, the uh, runs along the ventricles. In fact, you can see over here, the lateral ventricles are uh, kind of form the dorsal border of the caudate, and that goes all the way uh, to the other end. So the, you have to imagine the caudate kind of wrapping around almost uh, right behind the putamen. So those two together are really one structure. So sometimes they're referred to, you'll see them named just the caudate putamen, or sometimes the word striatum. Um, in fact, the reason uh, the word striatum is used is that the word means striped or layered because if you look at this same structure or the the homologous structure in a rat brain the two the, the caudate and the, the putamen are not separated they're just one structure 
and there are a whole bunch of white matter fibers that go through it and so it looks from the side kind of striped when you dissect it out um, and in the human or in primates generally uh, instead of having uh, bundles of white matter go through the striatum you have just this big bundle of axons which is um, the internal capsule that just kind of splits the whole thing into two structures so um, anyway that's just another bit of, of terminology so sometimes you'll see those those terms used to describe the structure but they all mean the same thing and then uh, just medial to the putamen is the globus pallidus so the globus pallidus is uh, right here uh, it, it also has kind of two parts but they they go together um, the the word globus pallidus just means pale globe um, and it just refers to the the uh, shape and, and color of this uh, structure under certain um, dissections but uh, it's also part of the basal nuclei and then you have two other regions the subthalamic nucleus um, which is kind of where you think it is so it's it's underneath the thalamus so this is the thalamus and then the subthalamic nucleus is right here uh, now one thing that might be confusing is the hypothalamus also is below the thalamus and that's what the word hypothalamus means um, but this is a separate structure from the hypothalamus in fact it's uh, kind of posterior to the hypothalamus so um, the thalamus and the hypothalamus are both part of the diencephalon the subthalamic nucleus is kind of on the border between the midbrain and the diencephalon, um, so probably it's, it should be considered part of the midbrain. Um, but the way this section was taken, uh, you can see the, the thalamus, which is again part of the diencephalon, and part of the midbrain as well. Um, in fact, the other important part of the basal nuclei is this region, the substantia nigra, and the substantia nigra is definitely part of the midbrain um, so that's what you're seeing here kind of the ventral midbrain and then parts of the basal telencephalon up here so all of these together there's four structures the the striatum the globus pallidus subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra all make up the basal nuclei um, and then the way they're connected looks kind of like this this is kind of a simplified diagram but it uh, makes it pretty clear how these different regions are connected to each other so the <clears throat> the caudate and the butamen together form the main input uh, to the basal nuclei so uh, this is where inputs from the frontal cortex come in so these are excitatory neurons in the frontal cortex that have axons that come down and project onto these neurons in the butamen um, and then those neurons are primarily inhibitory so they're they express GABA as a neurotransmitter and so they then synapse onto neurons in the uh, the globus pallidus so the general pathway of information here looks like this you have uh, from the cortex to the butamen from the butamen to the globus pallidus and then from the globus pallidus out another inhibitory projection to the thalamus specifically this part of the thalamus which you can also see here called the ventral lateral nucleus and um, those neurons in the ventral lateral nucleus have a projection that goes back out to the cortex specifically the uh, again area six of the cortex that's again why we call this a motor loop because it goes from the cortex um, uh, through the basal nuclei and the thalamus and then back to the cortex again um, but what's important is you have uh, both excitatory and inhibitory projections within this circuit so the the input from the frontal cortex is excitatory that's what these little plus symbols mean um, so whenever these neurons are active it makes these neurons in the putamen more active but these neurons are inhibitory so uh, when they're active they inhibit the neurons in the globus pallidus that's what the little minus symbols mean and then those neurons are also inhibitory so when they're active they inhibit the uh, axons or the neurons in the thalamus that project back to the cortex so uh, the idea is that whenever this projection a signal comes from the frontal cortex it turns on the neurons in the putamen which in turn turn off the neurons in the globus pallidus that would inhibit the neurons in the ventral lateral nucleus and that actually activates them so it, it's a way for the axons or the, these neurons in the frontal cortex to activate neurons in the uh, in area six kind of indirectly by uh, 
not directly activating them, but removing inhibition. So um, at, at rest, when these uh, frontal cortex neurons are not active, these neurons down here in the globus pallidus are active and they're inhibiting, partly, these neurons that are communicating back to the motor cortex. So that sort of reduces the overall activity in the motor cortex, which means when, uh, when there's no activity or no input from the frontal cortex, you get overall reduced uh, motor output. So, so this uh, output from the globus pallidus would be active whenever um, you're not actively moving. But then when a command to move comes from the frontal cortex, it first goes through this pathway and that sort of releases that inhibition. So it's sort of like taking the brakes off um, and that allows the motor cortex to become active. Um, and then the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra both are there to sort of keep things going. So the subthalamic nucleus actually sort of keeps the uh, the baseline activity of the globus pallidus uh, turned on when you're at rest. And then the substantia nigra also um, keeps the putamen active. So, uh, and this, believe it or not, is a, a simplified uh, version of this circuit. It, it can get a lot more complicated than that. Um, but to kind of understand what this part of the brain does, uh, it's best to look at what happens when it doesn't work. Um, and there are two major uh, well-studied diseases uh, that occur when there is damage to the basal nuclei, um, or to, to some part of the basal nuclei. <clears throat> Um, and one of those is Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder primarily, and uh, these are just some of the common symptoms. So hypokinesia, meaning just reduced movement. So people with Parkinson's um, tend to uh, kind of sit or, or uh, sit, stand still for long periods of time. Um, bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement. So when they do move, it tends to be uh, kind of slow and deliberate. Um, and then akinesia means uh, just difficulty in initiating movement. So when they, they try to move, it takes a lot of effort. Um, and then in a lot of parts of the body, you have rigidity, which means that the muscle uh, muscles have a lot of sort of resting tone to them. So um, people with Parkinson's will appear sort of hunched over with their, their arms kind of uh, bent. Um, and then for some people, uh, there's also a sense of resting tremor. Um, so that's usually what the, the symptom most people think of when they think of Parkinson's, but um, it's not uh, present in all patients. And it's only a resting tremor, meaning that it only occurs when uh, a person is, is otherwise sitting still and at rest. So uh, someone with a resting tremor in, say, their hand, as soon as they try to use their hand, try to reach and grab something, for example, the resting tremor actually goes away. So, uh, but that is a, a, another hallmark of the disease. Um, in fact, here, let's see if I can play this video. Um, this is just some examples of what I, what I just said. These three patients show more significantly affected gait. They all have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. This first patient is probably the most affected. His stride length and arm swing are very decreased. There you can see this turning on block. He also had some slight freezing in that turn. Uh, the amount that his stride length is shortened uh, and the festination interfere with his gait, making it difficult. Therefore, I would rate that a, a Okay, so here's a short video that just shows some examples of some of these symptoms. These three patients show more significantly affected gait. They all have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. This first patient is probably the most affected. His stride length and arm swing are very decreased. There you can see this turning on block. He also So this is a video uh, that just shows some examples of some of these symptoms. These three patients show more significantly affected gait. 
they all have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. This first patient is probably the most affected. His stride length and arm swing are very decreased. There you can see this turning on block. He also had some slight freezing in that turn. Uh, the amount that his stride length is shortened uh, and the festination interfere with his gait, making it difficult. Therefore, I would rate that a, a, a two on the UPDRS. The second patient has decreased stride length and some dystonia in the neck, which make his gait somewhat difficult. This third patient shows the response to medications that can happen in Parkinsonian gait. First here we see him with significantly stooped posture. And then next with meds, he has better stride length. And although his posture is still affected, has is improved somewhat. These three patients show severely affected Parkinsonian gait. This first patient actually has a diagnosis of multiple systems atrophy, or MSA. You can see the difficulty she has rising out of a chair, even needing assistance using her hands to push up. When walking, she is unable to walk without an assist device here, her cane, and has much difficulty taking any steps. Once she's out in the open, she fares a little better. However, her shortened stride length and severe truncal dystonia here leaning towards the right, which could be described as Pisa syndrome, which is frequently seen in MSA, are causing her severe gait disturbance. This second patient has idiopathic Parkinson's disease and is off his medications. We can see that he needs full assistance to stand and is unable to even take one or two steps in his gait. This last patient demonstrates the postural instability seen in some Parkinson's patients. On pull test for balance, she has complete lack of postural responses and needs to be caught by the examiner. Okay, so Parkinson's disease is caused when neurons in the substantia nigra die. And uh, this is usually um, a, a thing that's diagnosed or can be diagnosed uh, at autopsy, meaning after someone has died, because there are other, other uh, movement disorders that can be caused by other things that have similar symptoms. But, but true Parkinson's disease is caused by um, the degeneration of neurons in the substantia nigra. So this is a, a cross section through the midbrain, which is where the substantia nigra is. And this is a view of the midbrain, it's kind of upside down, but um, this is where the substantia nigra is actually found. And in fact, you can see why it's called the substantia nigra, uh, which literally means black substance because the neurons in here produce a, a large amount of melanin um, as a byproduct. And so they actually look uh, black or dark brown um, in cross-section. And so in people with Parkinson's, these neurons die. And uh, so when you look at someone's brain with Parkinson's, uh, that, that uh, black or dark brown substance is gone because the neurons are gone. Um, and the, the reason actually they're black in part is because these are neurons that produce dopamine. And uh, it turns out that one of the byproducts of dopamine metabolism is uh, melanin. So uh, that's why these neurons look the way they do. And again, their job is to project to the uh, putamen. So neurons in the substantia nigra send dopaminergic input to the putamen. That has a uh, sort of uh, increased modulatory effect. So that sort of keeps the activity uh, or makes the neurons in the putamen more responsive to uh, ex excitation by the frontal cortex. So it just sort of keeps them online. So the, the neurons in the putamen themselves don't die. It's just these neurons that die in Parkinson's. So when they, when they go away, um, the excitatory activity from them goes away in the putamen. So it's just harder than for the, the frontal cortex neurons to activate the putamen neurons, which in turn means that it's harder for the, the putamen, caudate putamen neurons to, uh, to inhibit the globus pallidus neurons. So there's an increased sort of baseline in inhibitory uh, output to the um, to the thalamus. So basically that means that, that these neurons in the, in the ventrolateral thalamus become less active and therefore the neurons that would normally be activated in 
uh, area six of the motor cortex become less active as well. So, so again, the job, one of the jobs of the basal nuclei is to kind of take the brakes off of the activity in the motor cortex. And in Parkinson's, you lose the substantia nigra neurons that sort of help that process along. Um, and then another uh, well-known disease that's associated with basal nuclei is um, Huntington's disease. So Huntington's uh, in many ways is almost like a mirror image of Parkinson's. So it's uh, associated with hyperkinesia. That means just uh, increased movement overall. Um, dyskinesia, so, so when people move it tends to be sort of abnormal and sometimes almost uncontrolled. Um, and in fact, the, the other name for the disease is Huntington's chorea. Uh, and chorea, in this case, uh, comes from the Greek word for dancing because that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and then uh, later on in, in the disease, it's associated with uh, dementia and sometimes personality disorders as well. Uh, because even though it starts as a movement disorder and it starts to some extent with the basal nuclei, it uh, uh, eventually affects the whole brain. So this is a normal brain, and this is someone with uh, a brain with someone with advanced Parkinson's. And the main thing you can see is the brain has a sort of overall shriveled look to it because a lot of neurons have died, uh, and a lot of the white matter connections between parts of the brain have gone away. But especially the, the caudate putamen. So this uh, big hole, of course, these are the lateral ventricles. So these are the lateral ventricles of a normal brain. And in a Huntington's brain, the, the lateral ventricles look very, very big, but that's really because these neurons right here that would uh, normally be part of the basal, uh, I'm sorry, the, the caudate putamen, this whole thing is caudate putamen. And in someone with uh, Huntington's, the caudate putamen is more like this. So it's, um, again, just kind of shriveled because uh, the neurons die. So these are both Huntington's and Parkinson's are what we call neurodegenerative diseases, progressive neurodegenerative diseases, which means that the neurons in these parts of the brain start to die and they just continue dying um, until that, that part of the brain no longer functions. Um, so with Parkinson's, it's just localized to the substantia nigra, but in Huntington's, it, it starts with the basal uh, uh, nuclei and kind of spreads from there. So it, again, uh, we're talking about uh, loss of the striatum and the globus pallidus and eventually um, other parts of the brain, including the cortex. So here, what, so in Huntington's, you've lost these neurons and these neurons. And actually, these are more important because uh, what this means is that there's no inhibitory output anymore or, or less inhibitory output from the globus pallidus to the thalamus. So these the lambic neurons um, become more active and it makes it uh, easier for them to activate these motor cortex neurons, which produces the increase in uh, motor behavior. So here's another video that kind of, uh, again, gives some examples of these, these symptoms. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, now, brother has um, a form of chorea. So when looking at someone with an abnormal movement, you look for fine things such as tremor, physiological, which, uh, is very, which we all have. Then it can move on to an endocrine tremor, such as thyrotoxicosis. It can be alcohol-related, alcohol withdrawal, other drugs. And then you move on to athetoid movements, which are more writhing movements. And you'll see with brother, as you, the longer you observe someone, the more information you get. So sometimes silence is better than speaking all the time. Um, with brother, he uh, presented, uh, what age were you, brother, when you first got abnormal movements? About 50. 50, and is it rude to ask what age you are now? 64. 64. And 99 as well. Oh, I see, okay. And did you, um, you, did you have anybody in your family was affected by this? Yes, the whole family. The whole family were affected. Okay, so you were, but you were, what age did you say you were when it started? 50. 50. 50. And that was the first time you noticed. And what's the first thing you noticed? I was sitting on the ground and falling. Uh, falling and, and, dropping things. and dropping things. So falling, dropping things. And what was the first one? Shivering, was it? Yeah. Shivering. Sorry, dribbling. Dribbling. Sorry, sorry, dribbling. Dribbling. 
Ah, I, I saw it. Okay. Now, sometimes people with Huntington's uh, have abnormal movements all the time. Sometimes they're less pronounced. And you have to watch closely to see this flexural extension of, of uh, brother's back. Um, he grinds his teeth quite a lot to try and overcome the orofacial uh, the, the career. Now, can you look at my finger here, yeah. please? And look up and look down. And look right and look left, all the way over to the door. That way. And to your right, head still. Well done. Left, right, I'm holding his head. Up high, look up high, and look down low. And there's a limitation as the condition goes on of eye movements. Uh, it's difficult enough to uh, <coughs> demonstrate, but abnormalities of saccadic eye movements are indeed progressive uh, reduction in, in the range of eye movements can occur. Now, the other thing that people notice is, can you open your mouth wide, brother, and stick out your tongue straight? Keep it out. Keep it out. Keep it out all the time. Don't let it back in. Come on. Keep it out as long as you can. Let's count to three. Go. One. 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 OK. And, and there's a difficulty with sustaining a movement. So as we see here with the right hand, if you don't mind, can you put your hand out straight in front of you, just your right for the moment, and close your eyes. Keep them there, and I want your eyes closed all the time. So hand out again. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of half support it here. Keep it there. And you can see the slightly writhing movements. Eyes closed when you can. I'm here now. Don't, don't hurt yourself. OK, now we try the left hand. If you put the hand out there, hold it there. Close your eyes, please. So they're quasi-purposeful, is the phrase that people use, as, as if they're on purpose movements. Um, and they're uh, generalized, affecting head to toe, generally the limbs more so than the head and neck. But uh, in Brother's case, it is affecting head and neck. Uh, it's affecting his speech. Uh, is your swallow affected? Yes. It is. Very, very much so. I have to say <laughs> things very slow. You have to uh, liquidize them? Yes, liquidize. Do you have oh, to liquidize them? You do have to. Okay. Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease. It's the sign. It's on. Ah, I see. Okay. So Huntington's disease, that's one of the first signs for you. I uh, know. For me, it was dripping on the ground. It was uh, dripping. dripping on the ground. Dripping on the ground. I went, I went up to just to come out of interest to be dying to have a blood test. So you had the test because your family were affected? Yes. And then you were told that you had the, uh, the trinucleotide repeat, yes. the triplet repeat. Yes. So you're probably well read on this yourself, so it's not jargon to you. Okay, so you kind of get an idea of the symptoms. And then another thing that makes Huntington's different from uh, Parkinson's and most other uh, diseases like this is that it is purely genetic. The cause of, of the disease is a gene. Um, it's actually a dominant gene, which means that if you uh, if you have it, you actually have a 50% chance of, of giving it to one of your kids. And um, uh, it means that one of your parents also had the disease. Um, uh, and it is, uh, like I said, progressive, uh, but it usually onsets late in life. So in other words, you can go uh, 50, 60 years without any symptoms at all, and then not until you're uh, you know, well past uh, the, the age that most people have kids do you find out that you have the disease. Um, it's caused by a, a gene that produces a protein that, um, when it's mutated, can uh, turn into these uh, uh, folding uh, aggregates in the brain that can kill cells. Um, now, why exactly it's, it targets the basal nuclei first is not clear, uh, but it does eventually affect the whole brain, um, as opposed to Parkinson's, which is not uh, has some genetic components. So if you have a parent with Parkinson's, you have a higher risk than someone who doesn't. Um, but again, if you have a parent with Huntington's, you have a 50% chance of having the, the disease, and there is a, a genetic test that will tell you um, whether or not you're a carrier or not. And if you are a carrier, um, you're, you're going to have the disease uh, at some point in your life. Um, uh, both are, are uh, have no cure. Um, there are some medications that can um, 
mitigate some of the effects. Um, so in the case of uh, Parkinson's, for example, because again, you're losing these dopamine neurons, uh, drugs that uh, that can increase dopamine levels in the brain can sometimes slow down the process, but otherwise uh, it is progressive and both are eventually fatal too. So with Huntington's, uh, again, it's in a way kind of the opposite of Parkinson's. You're you're taking the brakes off. So the the output from the basal nuclei from the globus pallidus is uh, again mostly there as a as a brake on motor activity. So if you if we go back and think of it in terms of just this simple loop here, so you have output from the cortex to the basal nuclei. Uh, again, here your old, your book still calls it basal ganglia. Uh, out from the thalamus back to motor cortex. Um, it, it's it's uh, uh, default is to to sort of inhibit motor cortex or inhibit the VLO, which would prevent uh, motor cortex activity. And the 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 idea is that the job of the basal nuclei is to inhibit those uh, those movements or those uh, circuits in the motor cortex that would initiate unwanted or undesired movement. So at any given time, uh, you know, you have all these inputs coming into motor cortex. So you've got inputs coming in from the prefrontal cortex. You have input coming in from the sensory cortex. You have inputs coming in from other subcortical regions. So all this excitatory activity coming in. And these all, in a way, sort of represent demands on the brain or the body that the motor cortex uh, can act on. So, you know, at any given time, uh, you know, you you may have the urge to, uh, you know, scratch your nose um, or to get up and, and uh, walk around or to speak when it's, you know, not a good time, whatever. Um, and all of those uh, uh, are, are coming in, all those sort of requests for motor activity are coming into the motor cortex at the same time. And so the, the model is that the basal nuclei's job is to suppress all of those. Um, and then when a, an actual desired movement or a, a voluntary movement needs to be made, um, then so, so once a decision, for example, to, to do something uh, starts in the, in the prefrontal cortex, then part of the, uh, that command gets sent to the basal nuclei which then, again, sort of releases the brakes, but only on that part of motor cortex necessary for initiating that movement. And so uh, those two functions, again, you can kind of see in the two diseases we talked about. So with Parkinson's, um, you, you lose the ability to take the brakes off. There's no, uh, there's no way or it's much harder for the cortex to to communicate through the basal nuclei uh, because there's there's that absence of baseline activity from the substantia nigra and so that just makes it harder for the for, prefrontal cortex to tell the motor cortex okay now it's it's okay to move um, and so that's why you get that that lack of movement whereas with huntington's um, you, the brakes are off, so there's there's less input to the motor cortex. Uh, I mean, less inhibition on the motor cortex from the basal nuclei, and so all those commands to move are sort of all trying to happen at the same time. So that's kind of what the chorea or the uncontrolled movement of the disease uh, might be. It's it's the the brain trying to do a bunch of different things at once. Um, essentially, and then of course, eventually, Huntington's affects the whole brain, so that's why you see um, effects that ha are not related to to movement. Okay, and so that does it for the basal nuclei. Next time, we'll talk about the cerebellum.